In this presentation, I want to begin to develop an application of assemblage thinking to the study of globalisation. Um, I'm trapped briefly presenting this series. Um, for those who speak is a fuller version, written version of this paper on the, the members' part of the website. So I just want to highlight really the main points in this presentation itself. The research comes, or the, the paper comes out of research we've been doing as part of the European Research Council grant, exploring um, globalisation as it is working through rural localities in different parts of the world and how those rural localities are responding to globalisation. But underlying that analysis has been this attempt to use assemblage thinking as a conceptual framework for this work. And therefore, I think the, um, the points you want to draw out in this presentation uh, around how one might apply an assemblage um, methodology, an assemblage ontology in this approach, in this context, uh, transcend the rural setting of the research itself and apply equally to urban settings as well. We started this research from the position of the relational critique of globalisation, which has been advanced by geographers such as Dori Massey and Ashemin, uh, essentially which contends or, or critiques the idea that globalisation is a kind of top-down, all-encompassing uh, movement, and instead argues um, for um, globalisation as the active reconfiguration and meeting up through practice relations of a multitude of trajectories, uh, and which are located and grounded in particular places. However, in trying to use this as our approach for the analysis of empirical uh, research uh, on globalisation and place, we then struggled with the need to think through how does globalisation from this relational perspective actually work in places? How does it actually work in transforming places? That leads us then to the micropolitics and in turn I think that drew us to assemblage thinking and we were attracted to assemblage thinking for its emphasis on emergence, on multiplicity and on indeterminacy. And in particular, although we have drawn to some extent on Foucault and Latour, um, but particularly drawn to um, Manuel's exposition of um, assemblage thinking, um, drawing more broadly on Deleuze and So what I want to do in this presentation is to say a little bit firstly about assemblage and its application in research and globalisation, and then to move on to developing this assemblage framework for globalisation research, um, and particularly uh, make some propositions with globalisation and place in assemblage in an assemblage perspective. There is a large amount of work already out there which uses the terminology of assemblage in relation to uh, uh, globalisation. However, as both Anderson et al. and uh, Bremer et al. have outlined different systems for the classification of assemblage work, we can see these different iterations of the use of assemblage in the work which is out there globalisation. So many apparent uses of assemblage in globalisation research are quite simply just empirical, uh, with assemblage largely <coughs> deployed as a descriptor. And the most, uh, the best well known, the best known example of this is Saskia Sassen's uh, work where she used the term global assemblages, but makes quite clear in her work that she using this simply as a descriptor as a taking an, an analytical um, basis from it. Um, the term global assemblage is, uh, is used with a greater analytical capacity. Uh, a, the, the, the work on global assemblage is particularly associated um, around the work of Collier and Ong, um, where global assemblages are seen as these systems that mix technology, politics, and actors in diverse configurations that do not follow given scales or political meanings, or political mappings. And they draw conceptually, particularly on Foucault's concept of biopic politics and governmentality. Um, to try to interrogate the ways in which technological, administrative and ethical regimes are articulated through these so-called global assemblages and how these reshape ways of ruling and, and living. I will skip over uh, that little quote. So what I think that we see here is uh, the Collier-Nong approach using assemblage as ethos to use Anderson and Tell's categorization, emphasizing heterogeneity, contingency and situatedness and the role of microprocesses in addressing globalisation. And 
This work has been interventional with global mobility, uh, the mobility policy, uh, and particularly this consolidation of neoliberalism as the dominant ideology of 21st century globalization. However, I think it only presents a partial reading of globalization, certainly only a partial application of assemblage thinking. Um, even in its more geographical application, and work back in like Gail Hollander, Tanya Murray Lee, there's a strange symmetry in the use of language here, in that the translocal networks, the translocal systems and regimes are being described in the assemblages, yet the places through which they operate and which they interact are not conceptualised as assemblages in the same way and remain somewhat unpacked in this analysis. Contrasting with that approach, we have the, the recent growth in the body of work of assemblage urbanism, which draws primarily upon uh, Latour and other active network theorists, uh, Michelle Cohen, John Law and others. Um, and as far as has uh, argued, this provides um, a foundation for an alternative ontology of city. And this rejects primarily by not at the binary country position of local and global. Uh, so see the global existing only in sites in which it's assembled from um, components. Um, okay, starting therefore by localizing the global back to these sites. Again, the attraction here for this relational approach to globalization of focusing in perhaps for how globalization is reproduced in particular local sites. Nonetheless, um, this also diverges from the global assemblage approach um, in interrogating the urban structure itself, and in particular in developing an emphasis on the materialities of the city. So much of this work has, for example, explored the infrastructures that connect the urban to the global, the global such as airports, ports, roads, railways, energy grids, communication systems, and so on. And in this way, you can see that it begins to answer the question of how globalisation transforms local places. But it also narrows this perspective, understating, I'd argue, the wider social and economic processes, and there's a large critique of that, I do by Neil Brenner. Um, and similarly, I think, um, again, neglecting, I think, some of the, 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 the kind of the most social dimension <coughs> of our assemblage, and particularly, I think, often not thinking about place as an assemblage in a holistic sense. That's what this leads us to. Manuel Glander and the Lucia Guitarian perspective, which we argue I think offers more potential to develop a more rounded analysis of globalisation in this context. I'm not going to spend time outlining these principles here, because Manuel um, reiterated these in his talk yesterday, but we know um, out of this work that uh, we can see a number of attributes of assemblages, uh, a number of the key priority, parameters of characterisation, decentralisation coding and decoding, and the fundamental point of global assemblage being defined by the exterior of relation. So I'm going to skip through those exploratory notes because we've heard them presented already. What I want to emphasise is then taking those principles and thinking through how does this help us to understand globalisation. And there's seven key points I want to make here. Firstly, Globalisation, I want to argue, involves the rearranging of components in assemblages, adding, detaching, altering, material expressive roles, reconfiguring relations between components, transferring components between assemblages. So one might think of branch plants which are taken over and sold from one corporation to another, international land transactions, commodities being traded internationally, migrants moving from one social assemblage to another. Secondly, Globalisation occurs through the recurrent interactions between assemblages. That those interactions, as Delanda uh, describes to some extent, uh, can result in the aligning of fusing of capacities to produce larger assemblages. In this case, the production of larger new translocal assemblages with a global reach. So one thing here about corporate mergers creating global corporations, the coalescence of social movements into transnational social movements, the tendency of trading blocs such as the EU, such as NAFTA, to then negotiate agreements between themselves to create even more extensive trading areas. Thirdly, globalisation also occurs through the deterritorialisation of assemblages, that we can see new connections being made, 
or relations of components between components being reordered, which overstill the boundaries of existing assemblages, existing local, existing national assemblages. The company that starts to export, the household sending a member abroad as a migrant, as a migrant worker, the localities which start employing migrant uh, labour, as well as perhaps literal forms of deterritorialisation, such as the detachment from territory that comes through corporate disinvestment, or the refugee fleeing from home. Fourthly, globalisation proceeds through cycles of coding, decoding and recoding. And this, I think, may include linguistic coding of scale. I'll come back to this slightly later on, but the way in which terms such as local, regional, national, international are codes which try to fix the identity of particular assemblages. We can also see decoding occurring as internal rules of assemblages are transgressed through an appeal to the global, tax avoidance by transnational corporations, illegal immigrants, or how global assemblages themselves develop their own internal codes and rules and give rise to new transnational regulatory assemblages which overcode the extent um, codings of local assemblages. Fifth, globalisation fostered by the tendency, globalisation is also fostered by the tendency of global assemblages towards internal homogeneity. And we can think here about transnational cooperation, standardising supplies, products and processes. I have in my mind a, a quote here from the, the French counter globalisation activist Jose Bové, who talked about McDonald's as the epitome of globalisation because they were arguing for one, one variety of potato using the, the, the uh, restaurants around the world. Tourism operators who seek to make the exotic familiar, supranational organisations which adopt the more universal standards, standards and values, and the way in which neoliberalism is pushing global economic assemblages towards trade liberalisation and the eradication of trade boundaries. Sixthly, globalisation is a more than human phenomenon. That global assemblages often can only be global because of the incorporation of non-human components that enable to transcend space, jet engines, fibre optic cables, satellites, refrigeration technology and so on. That non-human components at the same time can only be arranged in this way um, and inscribed in meaning through, meaning through human agency, that the human and non-human are acting in conjunction here. Yet at the same time, you can also see how some non-human entities escape from globalising assemblages to form new distant assemblages, new distant lines of flight, such as those of invasive species, such as those of global pathogens. And then, finally, globalisation is not a linear process, but we have these iterations between territorialisation and deterritorialisation, between coding and decoding, that there is, from this perspective, no clear line of causality. There's no clear sense that actually there's a central global force which is spreading out globalisation, radiating globalisation out from some imagined global command centre. There's no clear line of causality. And that often we can see rhizomic assemblages promoting globalisation through reproducing, through mimicry and imitation, social movements which spread in this way, cultural fashions, technological mimicry. So we have a series of principles around the application of assemblage thinking to globalisation. There's two further issues, I think, however, arise from this particular application, which we need to put on ponder. The first is around scale. And this, I think, has been implicit in some of the presentations we've heard over the last day or so. In that, there's an issue here about reconciling assemblage as a flat ontology, in which the relations between components are not hierarchical, but actually any component may speak to another component, with the inevitable language of scale when we talk about globalisation. And in the paper I developed this discussion, both suggest that there are three particular mobilisation of scale we can see through assemblage thinking. Firstly, scale is what I call here magnification. In other words, um, assemblage is existing in nesting sets, so that we, as uh, we heard yesterday, we can open the components of one assemblage and see that as, a, as an assemblage in its own right, and the components of that an assemblage in its own right. And yet, even though that 
when we start describing the case, seems to imply hierarchy, there are ways in which those may exist in non-hierarchical hierarchical arrangements. For example, in that components of, say, the third order assemblage may also be a component in its own right in the first order assemblage. And we can see whether it was relationships are not necessarily mediated through the hierarchy. Secondly, we can also, I think, perhaps think of scale as reach, which is part of the expression of territorialization, certainly in other in literal spatial terms, um, where we can have a tight compacting, a high degree of homogeneity in terms of the reach of an assemblage, as against an assemblage which has greater reach because its components are more widely spread, either literally, geographically, or figuratively. And thirdly, we can think of scale again, as I mentioned, as coding. That to code something as local to component, as national to component, as global, implies certain ways of operating certain regimes of authority. And then secondly, the issue of power and agency in assemblages. And here we draw from the idea that certainly uh, assemblages imply a distributed agency, that capacities, that puissance uh, is embedded in relationships between the components. And what this leads us to think is that there's no predominant direction to the exercise of power and agency in globalisation. The global does not always impose its will on the local. Neither, however, can the local always resist the global. So we have uh, a series of propositions, a series of principles about how globalisation itself may be conceptualised from an assemblage uh, framework. Um, because those assemblages all involve material components, and because material components have a physical existence somewhere which takes up space, we can lead from this analysis to think about how globalisation always operates through particular spatial locations, through particular places. And in doing so, because those components will also be embedded in other assemblages which have a spatial territorialization, we can also think about how those changes that we describe as globalisation serve to transform what we might understand as place. So this leads me back to the question I started with, is how does globalisation transform places? And to, lead, to apply this assemblage thinking in this context, we also need to think about how we think of places as assemblages. And I just note here, almost an aside, that actually despite the, the popularity of assemblage thinking in human geography in recent years, there's been surprisingly few analyses, empirical analyses, of places as assemblages. Much of the work, for example, in the urban assemblage uh, literature are talking about assemblages within the city, assemblages that constitute the city, rather than the city itself as an assemblage. And others actually tend to be fairly partial in the particular type of approach they take. I find this surprising in some degree because of the way in which Manuel and his works actually often refers to geographic examples to <coughs> illustrate the principles of assemblage, albeit largely in abstract terms and often in historical terms. But nonetheless, there's quite easy to go through um, um, an impossible site for assemblage theory and identify polite these examples of how places like in day, neighbourhoods, cities, regions, nations can be seen as assemblages and express the um, express the, um, the, the features in assemblage, um, whether that's the, 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 the theory of expressive those components, characterization, deterritorialization, coding, and I'd also have here that places, I think, are the components of places are commonly defined by exteriority. You can take components out of a place, out of a city, into another city, and they retain themselves, they're not defined by the interiorized relations in the city. So, head towards the conclusion. This leads me to the point of making four propositions as to how, by adopting this assemblage thinking approach, we can argue that globalisation transforms places. The first of these is that globalisation impacts on places through the interaction between place assemblages and translocal, social, economic, cultural, political and technological assemblages. That can be thought by the you know, by accepting that place and translocal assemblages, shared components, but with different roles in those uh, different assemblages. We can see how changes in one assemblage in, uh, have the potential to also change relations in the other assemblage. So the relations of a component in a translocal assemblage may change 
reverse effects of the material are expressed as well against it in the blade assemblage, a factory switch introducing goods for different markets, being taken over by different corporations. That does not necessarily change the role that factory plays as part of the city. But we can also think of instances where the recapitalisation of a translocal assemblage does impact upon the repeat material role of that component in the place assemblage. So the factory being closed removes the role, the material role that factories play as a source of employment in that time. Foreign direct investment, reverse process, the arrival of new migrants in a town. And even if we can see entities losing material roles in place assemblage due to re-territorialisation of assemblages, they may return an expressive role in that place assemblage. So I tend to give the example here of um, the Samson and Goliath shipyard trade in Belfast. Um, these lost their material role in the place assemblage of Belfast when the shipyards closed due to the deterritorialization of the shipbuilding industry, yet they remain and perform an expressive function as symbols of the identity of the city. In our work in the global countryside, we see the example in places like Nambour in Australia, where the, the sugar mill, which was a central town, closed in 2003 through the deterritorialization of its corporate owners, uh, Fina Sucre, in response to the reterritorialization of the global sugar market, in which uh, Australian sugar was not competing against sugar from Brazil and Thailand. And, and that meant that the various components of that sugar mill assemblage within Nambour, the machinery, the correct, the, 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 correct, uh, the cane tramway, which brought the sugar gain in from the cane fields, the cane fields themselves, lost material roles they had been performing. Yet they persist in their expressive functions as symbols of the identity of this town, so sugar town, and have been incorporated into new assemblages based on heritage, based on um, tourism, based on house building. Secondly, the effects of translocal and place assemblages are linked by developments and assemblages of connectivity that provide conduits between places. And these have both enabling and contrasting effects. And in A New Philosophy of Society, uh, Manuel talks about the example of how the uh, technology of steam engines and the distance required to get up to speed and brake had the effect of conditioning the distances between suburban railway stations and therefore had an impact on the morphology of urbanisation. And that's the context of contemporary globalisation. We can think about how, say, budget airline travel has enabled the expansion of international tourism, yet is in the same way constrained by the technology of the aircraft, the range of the aircraft, the various pricing conditions of different airports and so on. Um, so we can see how these how yeah, the, the connectivity, the technology of connectivity have both enabling and contrasting effects. Again, our uh, research would be looked at the dirt the New Zealand dairy industry and how this has been reoriented to territorialised to service uh, the market in China. But that again is conditioned by technologies, connectivities, uh, whether that be the technologies involved in turning the milk into a transportable uh, product, uh, milk powder, UHT. Uh, milk. Uh, how that is then um, structured by the location of the milk processing plant, by the transport which moves that to the port, by the size of the ships available, by the capacity of the ports to take certain types of ships, and therefore the geographies of this assembly are conditioned in that way. Thirdly, patterns of deterritorialization and reterritorialization in translocal assemblages prompt patterns of deterritorialization and reterritorialization in place assemblages. So, foreign direct investment and disinvestment, booms in international tourism, out and in migration, are all deterritorializing pressures on place assemblages as they dilute the internal homogeneity and are transgressed the spatial boundaries of those, um, of those place assemblages. And this can in turn lead to new forms of territorialization and connectivity, which are introduced to try to bridge or reflect these new relationships. They may be spatial organizational. The new road built out to the airport uh, are organisational, such as initiatives to integrate migrants into a city. So here again, in the research we're doing, we can look at something like Bali Harness in Ireland. This is a small town of 1,500 people, 50% um, of whom are born outside Ireland, 
and that population includes people from 40 different nationalities, some of them economic migrants who've been coming here over now a 40-year period, um, some of them asylum, asylum seekers, refugees housed in accommodation centres in the town. Those, that change of population is an expression of the decentralisation through diasporic networks, through the lines of flight of refugees, um, but it also then has a deterritorialization effect on Ballyharness as a place assemblage. Um, there's a lot of the homogeneity, the fact of this being a homogeneous Irish Catholic society. Key sites important such as the church or the Gaelic Sports Association, which want the glue of that assemblage, are losing their centrality. We get new sites, such as the mosque, which become themselves the centre of new forms of territorialisation. Or we get initiatives such as uh, integration days, sports days run by the Gaelic Sports Association for migrant uh, members of the community. And then fourthly, globalisation from process of decoding and recoding in place of seven of meanings are renegotiated and rules no longer hold effectively. So the change in formal codes, such as land use planning policies, changes in informal rules of everyday social interaction, the language which is used in the streets, the customs and cultural practices which are understood and tolerated and expected. Or recording which comes from incorporation into translocal assemblages and a tendency towards internal homogeneity within those assemblages, such as new rules for areas designated as national parks, nature reserves, etc., which are expected to conform to universal standards and that overcodes the existing informal rules coding of use of that resource by local populations. Or indeed, this might be seen as changes in the relative strength of these codings of the different assemblages of which components are part. So again, conservation becoming a stronger coding than maybe the resource use which supports its coding within place-based assemblages. And as a final example, again, for global rural research, uh, this is Trapasse, a fishing village on the west coast of Canada, um, or was a fishing village until the fish assemblage, the, 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 the fishing assemblage out in the North Atlantic was recoded with the cod being encoded as an a, a, uh, endangered species and fishing in the banks of Newfoundland um, band, the moratorium introduced. That removed a key material component of Chipasse as a place assemblage, the fishing fish, fish plus sink plant closing the fishing fleet, disappearing fish being removed as a material component of this place, which led in turn to 90% um, unemployment in Australia in the 1990s, and then deterritorialisation uh, we see it throughout migration with three quarters of, of the town's population leaving over the last 25 years. <coughs> so that was rushing quickly through these ideas, but what we've tried to argue here is that assemblage thinking can be used to highlight the market politics of globalisation, emphasise the contingency, heterogeneity, and contestation. That globalisation, seen from this perspective, involves processes of reassembling through interaction with global, national, and local assemblages, understanding both assemblages here as nouns. And we can see it place the reconstituting globalisation through interaction with translocal assemblages, the introduction of important components and process of re-territorialisation and recoding. And as such, what we want to argue through this paper, and what we then try to put in practice, or are, are trying to put in practice, uh, ongoing in the research that we're doing, is that assemblage thinking provides a framework for operationalising operationalizing relational perspectives of globalisation, addressing questions of how globalisation is reproduced through places, and how places in turn are transformed through globalisation. Thank you.